Technology is the best thing that ever happened to mankind. We'd be living in tent and hunting buffalo and dying at 35 but for technology. We work five days a week as opposed to being afraid for a live seven days a week. Jamie Dimon is the CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase and one of the most influential people in business. His work steering the bank through the financial crisis, J.P. Morgan is currently the largest of the U.S. banks, showed that he could lead in good times and bad. Now, with new competitive and economic pressures on the horizon, we talked with Jamie about how he navigates J.P. Morgan, about the role of regulation, and about what he thinks private enterprise needs to do to help communities that are falling behind. I wanted to start with something that was big news and is capturing so many people's attention, um, which is Amazon buying Whole Foods. And you look at this $13.7 billion deal, a tech giant moving into groceries. You, since 2014, have been saying, you know, Silicon Valley is coming for banking. I'm curious whether this is the moment where you now see the big tech guys coming after banking, or is banking next, and how you prepare for right. it? Who would have thought that Amazon would go into movies? So I'm not sure this is a bigger difference. He was always selling goods. I think anything Jeff does is interesting and exciting. He's a good friend of mine. I think he's brilliant. Uh, so I, to me, there's a natural thing because it's a huge part of sales. And uh, it's a huge part of what they want to get, you know, with that hour time frame or three hour time frame. So tech has always been a huge part of banks. Right. We've been using tech for years to drive down costs, digitize more and more data. Of course, it's faster. It's more money being thrown at more Silicon Valley in a good way. I'm in favor of global competition. I think it's called capitalism, uh, but they want to disrupt and do things. They're also are very good at straight through processing, reduce the pain points. You know, sometimes I make fun that banks were pretty good at increasing your pain points. When you look at something like Amazon has said that they did about $1 billion in small business loans in the last year. Obviously that's small potatoes compared to right. JP Morgan, but it shows that they are doing more and more in this. Really for you, it's just, hey, more competition is good competition? I, you don't, you don't I guess worry I'm, at all. I'm, I'm in favor of competition. I'm in favor of people trying to disrupt. I'm in favor of all types. You know, they, they have data on merchants mm -hmm. that we don't have. They're rather small merchants. They're rather short-term loans. And they can charge rates that I'd have a hard time charging. So they have a, a competitive niche that they can do and compete. And I think that's a good thing. So, you know, that type of stuff forces us to do a better job for our clients. And we have to use that to, to be better. Okay. And we do, we do that with digital. We do it online, mobile, bill pay. Uh, moving money around the world. When you look at the regulatory environment, obviously big changes seem to be coming. You have the House just recently passed the Choice Act. The Treasury Department released its first report saying how the financial system needs to be regulated. And a lot of the language seems to come from your letter to shareholders. Do you see regulation as being a moat for you? Does that, is that a protective level, something that people can't catch up to? Is it a problem? How do you view regulation? You know, it's, it's a little bit, a bit of both. So, First of all, the regulations need to be looked at and need to be made rational. But I've always agreed that they hurt small banks more than bigger banks. Mm -hmm. So when you look at the state of regulatory reform, are you feeling good about what's coming down the road? Do you think that, that Washington is going in the right direction? Yeah. I think that Treasury report had a long list of things that should be looked at. I don't know, look, we are not here saying throw out Doc Frank, not here go back to the good old times. When I talk about reforming mortgage, they say they just want to go back to the good old times. I'm not talking about going back to subprime. I'm talking about going back to it's okay to lend to a first-time buyer who has a little more risk, you know, and that the person you're hurting is the first-time buyer. The person hurt by the, by the restriction of mortgage credit were young people, immigrant, self-employed, prior defaults. It wasn't J.P. Morgan. So when you look at this, too many people argue, oh, the banks just want it for themselves. No, I think we hurt them. I think we hurt our citizens. I think our rules and regulations for its small business formation, our lack of ability to get permits for infrastructure and jobs. So I can go on and on about the things we've done to hurt ourselves, and this is just part of getting it right. Just anything, every time you have regulation, it's got to be calibrated right. Okay, so I agree when people in Washington say we need to do this. Of course we want a safer system. Okay, and so let's just, let's just calibrate. Just saying more, more, more isn't sufficient. So do you then get involved in this? Do you go out to Washington and meet with? Of course, yeah. And, and are you saying don't remove everything? You know, the Volcker rule, yeah. let's keep that in place. Let's, so let's the, the work choice, on the edges. So the Choice Act won't affect us at all because it's, it's an off-ramp, which the big banks won't be able to do for a whole bunch of different reasons. And I'm not even sure, sure they should because, you know, there are, you do want to regulate big banks differently than small banks and just rationally so. And, uh, and of course, we go down there all the time. And, you know, I just want to see the rational things done. I tell people, think of us as a Costco or a Walmart. 
You know, we have huge flows. We want to offer clients execution, research, price. So you have inventories constantly turning. There's risk in that, but it's very tightly managed. But and pre so, Dodd Frank, couldn't you take a lot more risk? Yes, and you did take a lot but, more. But risk. I'm saying, I, but we didn't say throw out Dodd Frank. I, what I'm saying is that one piece about how you define market making is it would stop some people from making active risk. I don't think it'll affect that, us that much. If you get change that, I don't think it'll affect us that much, but it'll just be a great sigh. It'll, it'll reduce costs because there's huge reporting requirements around it. And if you're a trader, you, know, you, don't, you don't think people are going to, it's going to be got you all the time. You know, I made a joke years ago, if you're going to be a trader, you have to have a, uh, you, know, you have to have a doctor, a lawyer, compliance, <laughs> looking at every trade. And we, we just overdid it. If you actually went through the detail, you'd look and say, my God, that's overdone. One market where you have been doing it is Detroit. You've been really focused on yeah. trying to revitalize Detroit. You'll put $150 million into yeah. Detroit by the end of 2019. And a lot of the focus is on funding small business, minority yeah. owned small business. Would you, you've been there for a number of years now. What have you seen that works or that has surprised you in terms of getting these small businesses off the ground or helping smaller agencies be able to fund uh, economic of, growth? You know, Detroit was an example of kind of an accident, accident waiting to happen. It happened. It went bankrupt in 2014 or so. But it had a mayor you know, and a governor who, were, instead of being ideological Republican Democrat, let's fix the lights, sanitation, police, create jobs, affordable housing. We sent teams of people up there to say, what can we do to help? And one of them was this uh, Entrepreneurs Fund of, for People of Color. And it's great. We, I know them myself. There's like 20 or 30 in the room. But you need bonds. You need capital. You need to buy inventory. So this fund has been doing great. And it's a very exciting thing to do. The population of Detroit, people don't fully understand this, went from 2 million to 700,000 over like 30 years. How do you, how does a city pay its taxes and maintain the roads and, and the police and the sanitation, the housing, the schooling? So the population, it seems like it's starting to grow again. You go to downtown, you, it was, I mean, it was dark and you wouldn't have walked around there. And now there are lights, music, restaurants. I mean, it's turning. How often do you go? Oh, I've probably been, I probably go two or three times a year. So are there examples yeah. of things that have started in Detroit and that you've then taken uh, national? Well, we're doing work skills in the South Bronx, mm -hmm. you know, and so we're doing it, we're, we're doing these things everywhere. We, we, we're doing something called the fellowship initiative that we take kids who we think are gonna have to, have a hard time graduating high school. So these are black males who have the worst dropout rates and stuff like that. We give them mentors, summer jobs, SAT training, how to fill out applications for schools. We put, I think, put 100 plus through. All 100 have gone to college, including places, I think, like Princeton and Harvard. Mm -hmm. Okay, I went to one in uh, LA recently, and the parents were there. There were tears in almost everyone's eye that these kids, and these kids can go back to their own communities. And we're going to double that program. We're going to be announcing one, I think, soon in Dallas and Chicago. And so, yeah, when we find things that work, we just, we're all in. Training veterans, going in the South Bronx, teaching skills. Are these areas that the government should be playing? Is this J.P. Morgan's role to be in, involved in this? I think, yeah, yes, because I think I've never had a conflict between shareholder value, customer, employee, and community. You know, we have to do all those things right. So we are going to do this and help the communities we're in. This company's been doing it for you know, almost 200 years. Now, but you are pointing out that sometimes you're making up a failed government policy. Schools should be working better on their own. But as you do this, it informs you how you can improve that. So there are ways that we do go back to government and we say, we need to change these things. Is government listening, though? Do they, and do they have the resources to be able to pull it off? One or do they see you as, we don't have to deal with it, now J.P. Morgan's going to come in no, and no, fix this I problem? I think one lesson is the local level, they are dying to do it. Mm -hmm. So mayors and governors who are willing to say, okay, I'll get the schooling system to do this, we'll do that, you do this. If you get those forces aligned, we're all in. If some of them you know, go back to bureaucratic, you can't teach our teachers, we're not going to change the curriculum, right. we're not in at all. We're not throwing good money after bad. And that is one of the lessons. Local government wants to do it. The federal government can play a role, but some of these things have to be done locally. And if you don't they have ha a partner, they have to be done well. It won't work. The economy is changing so fast. And Buffett, at the annual meeting, said he did a kind of a thought experiment where he said it's possible that Geico could run with only a third of the number of people that we have. And at Walmart's annual meeting, they said the same thing. We might have, you know, they might have reached peak employees. When you look out, you have so so much knowledge of AI. You're investing in things. You see where the future is going in terms of programs replacing people. How big or small could J.P. Morgan be? And then also, what does it mean for the economy? I think people are massively overreacting to this, okay? Because you could have said the same thing. We had 20 million people in the farm. So, oh my God, with this equipment and stuff, 
and you know, product two is going to go away, we're going to go down, and we're going to go down a million people, my God. Well, you know, we did, and it was okay. The economy is a massive thing that's constantly adjusting. Technology is the best thing that ever happened to mankind. We'd be living in tent and hunting buffalo and dying at 30 fiber for technology. We work five days a week as opposed to being afraid for a live seven days a week. I think I always make a joke in Europe that already down to four days a week. Mankind will adjust, okay? It's the don't stop technology, but it's okay to acknowledge it has some downsides. So technology and trade, so it hurts, so we all benefit. You know, everything you buy is cheaper, it's made here, but, uh, but it's, it's amazing. Some of the countries that are the best in manufacturing are also the best in robotics. South Korea, Japan, they're booming in, this, in that area. So I think it's a mistake to say technology. Let technology do its job. We collectively have to do it, society, CEOs, government, you know, schools have to do a better job. What do you do when it disrupts you as an individual, or that town, or that industry? I think, you know, to me, I know we know what we should do income assistance, retraining, relocation in a comprehensive way, and it works, but we haven't done it. So our industry, you know, we don't teach enough skills anymore. And a lot of these jobs are better. So I did the thought experiment. If you can eliminate eight million driver jobs immediately, what would you do? I said, you wouldn't allow it. You'd say, you know what, let's do it over four or five years. Let's go to every trucking company, every taxi company, everything, and teach them how to retrain, relocate, give incentive, you know, uh, uh, income assistance. But there are great jobs out there. There's a school right across here that teaches people how to maintain small aircraft. Every kid, it's high school, they'll graduate $65,000 a year. There's machine tooling, nursing, radiology, uh, uh, sales jobs. Uh, there's an automotive school in the South Bronx, high school. And you know, ma maintain automobile now is computers, basically. All the kids graduate $45,000 a year, quickly to 70 or 80. So there are solutions. So stopping technology is the bad one. The good one is the retraining, income assistance. And I also support the earned income tax credit, which pays people to work who are making seven, eight, nine dollars an hour, gives them more of a living wage. I would like double that program. So the people have the dignity of a job, the first job leads to a second job. When people work, they want to continue working. It'll, it'll be better for society. Everyone's involved. It's better for household formation. It'll help solve you know, some of these society ills. So I think society has solutions. And we're a wealthy enough nation to do the ones that really work for everybody. You know, I think we've done a particularly bad job taking care of those left behind. And when I say we, I mean leadership collectively. Unions, politics, CEOs, schools. We didn't fix some of the problems we had, and those people who are suffering, you know, they basically have let us know at this point. I think the question is, is this gonna happen so fast that people will lose their jobs and not be able to take the skills I, training? I think if it does, we should, we should come up with ways to let it happen, maybe slow it down a little bit, but don't stop it. Don't micromanage it, it's not gonna work. How do you slow it down? Well, I just said, government can say, you can't lay off all your people more. You're gonna lay them, you can do so many a year. You can do so many things. We'll come up with programs that actually fix it. And so, and businesses are pretty resilient. Businesses change all the time and society changes. So as these things build, as these things shrink, these things grow up. Those people are not doing this, go do something else. That's been all of society. I remember hearing that agriculture will have no more productivity increases. You got the big machines, you got all this stuff. It's still been 1% a year for the last 20 years or something. Now, you know, now they water by the, you know, by the yard. The, the seeds are better, the machines are better, the satellites are better, the, you know, everything that takes place is better. So productivity is a good thing, and it just frees up human, humans to do other things. So five years out, how big or small is J.P. Morgan? Oh, hopefully bigger. We actually have less sales and traders, for example, but more engineers, more coders. You know, as we can do some of these things, we go to more countries. So these things give us an opportunity to take our resources, do something else with them. So I'm not worried at all about J.P. Morgan that, to that extent. Bigger in terms of reach, in terms of revenue, in terms of profit, yeah. but maybe smaller in terms of the total number of people required. I, I, I wouldn't to do say that. that. We're using bots today. It's not going to stop us from opening retail branches. You know, so it's not going to stop us from any private bankers or any investment bankers in countries in Africa we're not in. So to me, we got all these growth opportunities, and yeah, we're always finding ways to be more efficient. But creating more efficiency creates capital that creates other opportunities. Now, to me, I'm not worried about that. My guess is our headcount will go up over the next 20 years, not down.